class. In this toolbox, we're going to put our knowledge of matrices to use in order to solve systems of equations. Systems of equations are often encountered in the environmental sciences in everything from solving a series of linked chemical reactions to quantifying the long and short-term costs associated with different alternative energy sources. Today we'll use matrices to find a simple prescriptive way of solving systems of equations. It will require that we first learn a bit about partition matrices and then learn some ways in which we can manipulate matrices without fundamentally changing their properties. So let's get started. The systems of equations that we'll be working with today are all examples of linear systems. That means that none of the variables in these equations are raised to an exponent in the equations. It also means that if we graphed any of these equations as a function of just one of the variables, we would get a straight line. The definition of a linear system of equations is a series of m linear equations with n variables or unknowns. Basically, it boils down to multiple equations that include multiple variables. Here's one example x plus 3y plus z equals 5, and 6x plus 7y equals 8. This system of equations has two linear equations and three variables. Here's another example, this time with four linear equations and four variables. And another example with two linear equations and two variables. One way to solve a system of linear equations like this is by rearranging one of the equations to solve for one variable and then substitute in for that variable. For instance, if we subtract y from both sides of the first equation, we can see that x equals 1 minus y. We can then substitute this in for x in the second equation. Our second equation now only includes y, so we can solve for y. And we find that y equals negative 2. We can now plug this back in for y in the first equation. And we can see that x equals 3. After solving a system of equations, it is always a good idea to go back and check to make sure that you're correct. So let's pull up that original series of equations again, and we will substitute in for x and y to make sure that these equations work. Does 3 equal 1 minus negative 2? Yep. Does 2 times 3 minus negative 2 equal 8? Yep. So this checks out, and we've solved the system of equations by substitution. You might also have learned another way of solving systems of equations by using the method of elimination by addition or subtraction. With a method of elimination by addition or subtraction, we can take advantage of the fact that if the left-hand side of equation 1 equals the right-hand side of equation 1, and the left-hand side of equation 2 equals the right-hand side of equation 2, then if we sum the left-hand sides of both equations, they will be equal to the sum of the right-hand sides of both equations. We can then see that x will be equal to 3, and we can substitute back into either of the previous equations and then solve that y equals negative 2. Happily, using either of these approaches gives us the same answer. I'd like to work through just one more example of using the method of elimination by addition or subtraction. All right, this time we have x plus 3y equals 7 and 2x plus y equals 4. We can't simply add the equations together to get rid of y like we did last time, but we can multiply both the left-hand and right-hand sides of the second equation by negative 3. Remember that if two things are equal, multiplying both of them by a constant number will retain the equality. So we multiply by negative 3, and then we add the first equation with our modified second equation, and we get negative 5x plus 0 equals negative 5. So x equals 1. If we now plug in for x in equation 1, we find that 1 plus 3y equals y, and we can so sorry, equals 7 and we can solve that y equals 2. Okay, so this method of elimination by addition or subtraction works well with simple linear systems. In a few minutes, we're going to talk about approaches for solving more complex linear systems. But first, let's talk about a real-world example. Okay, let's say you've got a favorite pond near your house. You've been going to that pond for several years, and over time, the water quality has gotten worse and worse. In fact, it's becoming just plain gross as it's become being overgrown with algae. You know a bit about aquatic ecology, so you suspect that this harmful bloom is caused by an excess of nutrients. You go out and measure the nutrient concentration in the pond, and sure enough, it is way too high. But if you want to fix it, 
you actually need to figure out where the nutrients are coming from, and this isn't always an easy task. You look at the hydrology of your pond and realize that there are only two major inputs of water. One is a stream that enters the pond, and the other is groundwater that seeps up into the pond. You really want to differentiate between these two different sources of nutrients because you know that the policies needed to clean up your pond will vary depending on which nutrient source is more important. The groundwater is coming from the residential area surrounding the pond and hence is likely the result of people adding fertilizer to their lawns. The river, however, is winding through an agricultural area, so most of its nutrient loading is coming from industrial scale agricultural fertilizer ad application. If you want to determine who needs to stop polluting your pond, your next step will be to also measure the nutrient concentrations in the groundwater and in the stream as it enters the pond. You find that the stream has a phosphate concentration of 20 micromoles per liter, and the groundwater has a phosphate concentration of 50 micromoles per liter. This is compared to a concentration of phosphate in your pond of 21 micromoles per liter. But just knowing the nutrient concentrations doesn't actually tell you which source is putting more nutrients into the pond. We want to know which is the most important source of nutrients, and that means calculating the flux of nutrients, or in other words, how many nutrients are entering the pond per unit time. The flux of nutrients will be equal to the water flow rate times the nutrient concentration in the water. Hence, the flux of nutrients from the river will be equal to the rate at which the river is flowing into the pond times the nutrient concentration in the river, and the flux of nutrients from the groundwater will be equal to the rate at which the groundwater is flowing into the river times the nutrient concentration in the groundwater. Our first step is to write out a system of linear equations. Let's call r the fraction of the pond's water inflow that is coming from the stream, and g the fraction of the pond's inflow that is coming from the groundwater. We can thus write a simple equation that, these two, uh, that tells us that these two have to sum to 1 because they are 100% of the water entering the pond. We can also write a mass balance for the nutrients in the pond. If we assume that nutrient uptake in the pond is negligible, then the amount of nutrients in the pond, which we measure to be 21, must be equal to the proportion of water uh, coming from the river times the concentration of nutrients in the river, plus the proportion of water coming from the groundwater times the concentration of nutrients in the groundwater. Okay, now we've got a linear system of equations. Let's see what we can do to solve it. With this equation, it makes sense to multiply everything in the first equation by 20 and then subtract off the second equation. 20r minus 20r means that we've eliminated r from the equation and 20g minus 50g is 30g, while 20 minus 21 is negative 1. We can thus calculate that g equals 1 over 30 and then plug this back into the first equation to solve for r. Solving this equation tells, that r, tells us that r equals 29 over 30. So we now that know that 1 30th of the water entering the pond is coming from the groundwater and 29 30ths is coming from the river. But what we care about is the flux of nutrients, not water. And we can calculate the fraction of nutrients that are entering the pond from the stream by multiplying the fraction of water coming from the stream times the concentration of nutrients in the stream, which is 20 micromoles per liter, divided by the sum of the fraction of water coming from the stream times the concentrations of nutrients in the stream, plus the fraction of water coming from the groundwater times the nutrient concentration in the groundwater, which was 50 micromoles per liter. This is equal to approximately 0 0.92, which tells us, tells us that approximately 92% of the nutrients entering our pond are coming from the stream. So if we really want to improve the water quality in our pond, we need to focus on cleaning up the river rather than cleaning up the groundwater. This will mean going and talking to the farmers to convince them to add less fertilizer to their crops, or perhaps to use less irrigation. So far we've dealt with very simple linear systems of equations, but we could have systems of equations with many different variables and many different equations. For instance, consider the system of equations here. It has five different variables, v, w, x, y, and z and it has five equations. We could solve this by substitution like we did previously. However, that would be pretty tedious and, more importantly, it is pretty likely that we could make a mistake somewhere along the way. There's also, however, a simpler way of solving complex linear systems equations like this. 
The first step in solving such a system of equations is to understand that we could write this entire thing using matrix multiplication. Remembering what we learned from the last uh, section, we can see that we could write the same system of equations as a single matrix equation. Our system of equations has the coefficients of each of the variables arranged in a matrix, and then that matrix is multiplied by a column vector that contains each of our variables. The product of these two matrices is set equal to a column vector of the values that each of the five equations are equal to. Let's take a moment and, and verify that this matrix equation works out to be equivalent to our system of equations. Remembering how matrix multiplication works, we multiply element 1 of row 1 of the first matrix by element 1 of column 1 of the second matrix, plus element 2 of row 1 of matrix 1 times element 2 of column 1 of matrix 2 plus element 3 of row 1 of matrix 1 times element 3 of column 1 of matrix 2 plus element 4 of row 1 of matrix 1 times element 4 of column 1 of matrix 2 plus element 5 of row 1 of matrix 1 times element 5 of column 1 of matrix 2 and this is equal to the first element in the last vector. We can see therefore that the first equation is perfectly represented by our equation of matrices. It's pretty easy to see that the other equations will be similarly represented. For instance, the second element is defined as the dot product of row 2 of matrix 1 times column 1 of matrix 2. Alright, so everything checks out and we've condensed our system of equations into a nice matrix equation. How does this help us solve the system of equations? Well, first we'll have to discuss something called a partitioned matrix. Partition matrices, which are sometimes called block matrices, are matrices that are interpreted as having different sections or sub-matrices. Basically, you can think of them as matrices that are made up of other matrices or vectors. Consider, for instance, a standard 4x4 matrix with elements A11 to A44. If we wanted to, we could then define new matrices P11, P12, P21, and P22 where these new matrices sorry uh, where these new matrices are 2 by 2 matrices that are defined as containing the elements in the upper left upper right lower left and lower right quadrants of a these colors now show clearly how the 2 by 2 matrices map into the four quadrants of a we can thus write a as a partitioned matrix that will be entirely equal to the original matrix, A. When using partition matrices, it is customary to include lines like these to denote the different partitions, blocks, or submatrices within the partition matrix. Note that if we wanted to indicate that A is a partition matrix without having to define the submatrices P11, P12, P21, and P22, we could also write it like this to make it clear that A is a partition matrix. So how does the concept of a partition matrix help us solve our linear systems of equations? Well, instead of having this entire matrix equation, we're going to write this out as a partition matrix. Let's first define our matrix as A, the vector of unknowns as X, and the vector on the other side of the equation as B. We can now write this entire equation as AX equals B. We refer to A as the coefficient matrix, because it contains all of the coefficients in our system of equations. We're now going to write a partitioned matrix that includes A and B. We refer to this partitioned matrix as the augmented matrix for our system of equations. This augmented matrix really contains all the key information for our system of equations, with the exception of the names of the variables. Now let's step back for a moment and consider a much simpler system of equations. Our system of equations will have three equations and three variables. We'll call those variables x1, x2, and x3. This is obviously a really simple system of equations, and we don't really have to do anything to solve it. But let me rewrite it for a second just so you can see what it would look like with coefficients normally written out. Obviously, we've just added a bunch of zeros in there since x1, x2, and x3 only actually occur in one equation each. Now if we write this as an augmented matrix, we can see that we have only a single one 
uh, and then some zeros in each column of the coefficient matrix. Any time that you can get your augmented matrix to take a form like this with basically just ones and zeros in the coefficient matrix, and no more than a single one in each column, you've basically already solved your system of equations. So how do we go about transforming an augmented matrix to get into a form like this? Well, there are three types of elementary row operations that we can perform on an augmented matrix without changing the meaning of the augmented matrix. We can swap two rows, we can multiply a row by a non-zero number, or we can add a multiple of one row to another row. So let's see how these actually work in practice and prove to ourselves that these don't change the meaning of the augmented matrix. Here I've got a system of linear equations that I've also written in augmented matrix form. Take a moment to ensure yourself that this augmented matrix is correct. Okay, so what do these elementary row operations actually do? Well, first we'll try swapping two rows. When we swap rows 2 and 3, we wind up with this system of equations and this augmented matrix. It should be clear that simply flipping the order of the equations does not change the overall solution or meaning of the system of equations, so that seems like a pretty safe thing to do. Next, let's consider multiplying a row by a non-zero number. Remember that our goal is to get all the entries along the diagonal to be equal to 1 and everything else on the left portion of the partition matrix to be 0. So obviously it would help to multiply the last row by 0 0.5. Let's consider what doing this will do. Functionally, we're going to multiply our entire third row by 0 0.5, which in the top equation is equivalent to multiplying both the left side of the equation and the right side of the equation by 0 0.5. So instead of having equation 2 times x3 equals 8, we'll have the equation zero point five times two x three equals eight times zero point five. Hopefully you can determine for yourself that if two times x three equals eight, then x three equals four. So multiplying an entire row by a non zero number certainly seems to work. Next let's talk about adding a multiple of one row to another row. Let's start off by looking at another element that we know we would like to make equal to zero. Since this element is off the diagonal, we know that we want it to be 0. To get it equal to 0, we could add negative 1 times row 1 to row 3, which we've previously swapped with row 2. Okay, so we've taken row 3 and added negative row 1 to both sides of it, which gives us 1 plus negative 1, negative 1 plus negative 2, and 3, uh, 1 plus negative 3, and 3 plus negative 17. If we look above to what this is doing to our actual equations, we can see that we now have x1 plus negative x2 plus x3 minus the sum of x1 plus 2x2 plus 3x3 equals 3 minus 17. Now let's make sure that this actually works. Let's start off by rearranging the first equation by subtracting off 17. In this case, we now have x1 plus x2 plus 3x3 minus 17 equals 0. We know that we can add 0 to anything without changing its value. So let's pull up our e original equation 3 and then add x1 plus 2x2 plus 3x3 minus 17 to the right-hand side of this equation. Again, we know we can do this because all we're really doing is adding 0. Now if we simply subtract x1 plus 2x2 plus 3x3 from both sides of the equation, we see that it gets us to exactly the equation that we found in red on the top right, which is exactly equivalent to our modified augmented matrix. Okay, so now we've basically verified it for ourselves that these elementary row options can all be performed without changing the equations. We've been applying them somewhat haphazardly. The really great thing about using an augmented matrix to solve different to solve linear systems of equations is that there is a fairly simple prescriptive playbook that you can use to solve such equations. Let's start off with another example. Alright, now we've got four equations and a total of four variables. Let's start off by writing the augmented matrix for the system. 
I've color-coded everything for a moment, so you should be able to see where everything in this augmented matrix came from. Remember, our goal will be to get ones along the diagonal and zeros elsewhere, and we can use any of those elementary row operations that we talked about before. We're going to do all of our operations on the augmented matrix for now, but I'll keep the original equations on the screen just a little bit out of the way so we can test everything at the end. I'm also going to keep the elementary row operations on the screen, but out of the way so you can refer back to them. Okay, so let's talk about the program we need to follow to solve any linear system of equations using our augmented, uh, equation, our augmented matrix. The first step is to define an element that we'll refer to as the first pivot. There's some rules for defining this pivot. The first pivot must be in the first row. It will probably be the upper left element. However, if the suspected pivot entry and all entries below it contain zero, we must skip that column and move to the right. Also, if the expected pivot contains zero, but at least one element below it has a non-zero entry, you should switch the two rows. Next, the pivot must contain the value one. If it contains a non-zero value that is not equal to one, you should multiply the entire row by the reciprocal, reciprocal of that value to convert the pivot to one. Okay, so let's look at our augmented matrix. Our first place to look for a pivot is the top left entry. So this is our first suspected pivot. Let's go through our checklist. Is the pivot and all entries below it equal to zero? No. So continue to the next on our checklist. Does the pivot contain zero? No. So continue to the next. Is the pivot one? Yes. Okay, we're happy that element works as a pivot. Our next step is to elimin eliminate all the entries below our pivot. And when I say eliminate them, I mean convert them to zeros by using our elementary row operations. This is actually pretty straightforward. We know that we already have a 1 in the pivot position. So if we look down to row 2, we have a 2 in the first element. So we can get rid of that pretty simply by adding negative 2 times row 1, or to state it more simply, subtracting off twice row 1. When we subtract off double row 1 from row 2, we wind up with 0, 0, 0, negative 6, negative 6. So we've eliminated the element in row 1. There's already a 0 in the pivot column in row 3, so we can skip on down to row 4. In row 4, we'll want to now subtract off row 1 to get rid of the 1. Subtracting row 1 from row 4 will give us a new row that equals 0, 3, 3, negative 1, and 8. So now looking at our pivot column, we've done what we wanted. We have a 1 in the pivot and zeros beneath it. Let's just rename our rows again to avoid confusion. And then we'll continue on to the next step, which is to define a new pivot. We start by moving to the next row and the next column. Then we basically follow the same checklist as before. Is the suspected entry and all entries below it zero? No, it's not because some of the entries below it are non-zero. Next, does the expected pivot contain zero but have non-zero entries below it? This is definitely true. If this is true, we need to swap the row with the pivot for a row below it with a non-zero entry. So let's swap rows two and three. Swapping these rows will give us a non-zero entry in our pivot position. Okay, we've swapped rows two and three and now have a non-zero entry in our pivot, so let's continue down the checklist. Does the pivot contain one? Yes, it does. So we're now happy with this as our pivot and we move on to the next step. Step four is the same as step two. We need to eliminate the entries below the pivot. In this case, the element in our new row three, which was the old row two, is zero, so we're happy there and can continue on down. In the bottom row, we have a three in the pivot column, so we need to subtract off three times our previous row three. And then we calculate this will, when, when we calculate this, it will give us zero, 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 negative four, negative four for our fourth row. So now we have a 1 in the pivot and zeros below it, and we can continue on. This is now an iterative process, and we need to define a new pivot. So let's move one row down and one column over, and let's check our checklist. Is the suspected entry and all entries below it equal to 0? Yes, this time that's true. So we need to skip this column and move one column over. Let's check again. Does the suspected pivot and all entries below it contain 0? No, 
Does the expected pivot contain 0? No. Does the pivot contain 1? No. So we should divide the row by the reciprocal of the value in the pivot, or in other words, divide the row by negative 6. When we divide the entire row by negative 6, we get 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Now we need to eliminate the elements below the pivot. We will eliminate it by adding 4 times row 3, which will give us all zeros for the bottom column. Our next step is to again define a new pivot. But now as we go down, we see that there are no more rows that can satisfy our requirements for a pivot. This means that we're done with the first part of solving the system of equations to eliminate all the non-zero values above our pivots. Let's first remember where all of our pivots actually were. Now we're simply going to work backwards through our pivots to eliminate the non-zero values above them using our elementary row operations. Our last viable pivot was the one in row 3, so we will start there. We want to eliminate the non-zero values above it. First we will subtract off row 3 from row 2. Then we will subtract off row 3 times row 3 from row 1. This now gives us zeros above the pivot, and it is time to move to our next pivot. If we look at the entries above this pivot, we can see that they are already zero. So there is no, nothing left for us to do. We've now solved this system of equations. Let's write out the result, resultant equations to see what they tell us. You can now see our modified augmented matrix written back as a system of equations. Let me just quickly arrange these equations by moving the z values to the right side of the equations. Here we've now got solutions to our equations. Note that the last equation actually says that 0 equals 0. This gives us no information about our variables, but really tells us that our initial system of equations were not all linearly independent. Next, moving upwards, we see that w equals 1. We then see that y equals 3 minus 3z and x equals 2 minus, sorry, y equals 3 minus z and x equals 2 minus 2z. Note that nothing tells us what z is. This means that z can take any value and that the value of z determines what the values of x and y must be. So there are actually infinitely many solutions to this system of equations, all with different values of z. Let's test things to see if this works. Let's first do a simple test to see a, uh, a test if z equals 0. If z equals 0, we can see that x equals 2, y equals 3, and of course w always equals 1. Let's plug that into our initial system of equations. After plugging in, we can test. Does 2 plus 0 plus 3 equals 5? Yes. Does 4 plus 0 equals 4? Yes. Does 3 plus 0 plus 1 equal 4? Yes. Does 2 plus 9 plus 0 plus 2 equal 13? Yes. So that solution works. Let's try one more. If z equals 1, we can see that x equals 1 and y equals 3, while again w is always 1. So let's plug those values in. OK. Does 0 plus 2 plus 3 equal 5? Yes. Does 0 plus 4 equal 4? Yes. Does 2 plus 1 plus 1 equals 4? Yes. Does 0 plus 6 plus 5 plus 2 equals 13? Yes. So clearly, at least those solutions work. And we could choose any other potential values for z to find more options that work. It is important to realize that a linear system of equations has the potential to have either one unique solution, infinitely many solutions like in this example, or potentially no solutions at all. Alright, let's now use these techniques to solve the sort of question that you might encounter in environmental sciences. You've been studying the concentrations of pollutants in an estuary, and you found that the atrazine levels are alarmingly high, so you want to know why. You know that the poisons have to be entering the estuary from its river, but the river has three different tributaries upstream. Which tributary is the source of the pollutants? Like in our previous example, if you want to solve this issue, you're going to have to figure out what proportion of the water in the main river is coming from each of the tributaries. In order to solve this problem, you've gone out and you've measured the concentrations of two pollutants, atrazine and mercury, in each of the tributaries 
and in the main stem. You found that atrazine concentrations in the tributaries ranged from 0.1 to 5 micrograms per liter in the tributaries and was 2.62 in the main stem. You also found that mercury concentrations ranged from 2 to 12 nanograms per liter in the tributaries and was 9.6 in the main stem. All right, our next step is to figure out how we can write this as a system of equations. Let's define x1 as the fraction of river water coming from tributary 1, x2 as the fraction of river water coming from tributary 2, and x3 as the fraction of river water coming from tributary 3. Now we can write out a system of equations. We know that the sum of the fractions of water coming from the tributaries has to be equal to 1. So we can write that x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 1. Next we can put together a mass balance for atrazine. The atrazine concentration in the main stem of the river, 2.62, has to be equal to the concentration of atrazine in tributary 1 times the fraction of water coming from tributary 1, plus the concentration of atrazine in tributary 2 times the fraction of water coming from uh, tributary 2, plus the concentration of atrazine in tributary 3 times the fraction of water coming from tributary 3. We can also construct a similar mass balance for mercury. The mercury concentration in the main stem of the river, 9.6, has to be equal to the concentration of mercury in tributary 1 times the fraction of water coming from tributary 1, plus the concentration of mercury in tributary 2 times the fraction of water coming from tributary 2, plus the concentration of mercury in tributary 3 times the fraction of water coming from tributary 3. Now we can construct our augmented matrix for the system of equations. Take a look at it and make sure that it accurately represents the equation above. Now let's get to work using our prescriptive plan to solve it. All right, step one is to define the first pivot. We always start looking in the top left. Does the suspected pivot and all entries below it contain zero? Clearly not. Does it contain zero with at least one non-zero element below it? Nope. Does the pivot contain one? Yes, so we're done with step one. Next we need to eliminate all entries below the pivot using our elementary row operations. Specifically, we can simply add or subtract multiples of the row with the pivot. Let's start with row two. We're going to subtract five times row one from row two. So now we've got zero, minus, negative two, negative 4.9, and negative 2.38. Next, we need to get rid of row 3 by subtracting off double row 1, which means subtracting 2 from each element. So that leaves us with 0, 8, 10, and 7.6. And now we've successfully eliminated all entries below the pivot. And it's time to move along to step 3 and find the next pivot. OK, so our next suspected pivot is the negative 2 in column 2, row 2. Does this suspected pivot and all entries below it contain 0? Nope. Does the expected pivot contain 0? Nope. Does the pivot contain 1? No. So we need to multiply row 2 by the reciprocal of negative 2. This gives us 0, 1, 2.45, 1.19. So now the pivot contains 1, and we can move on to step 4. We must now eliminate the entries below the pivot by subtracting 8 times row 2 from row 3, which gives us 0, 0, negative 9.6, and negative 1.92. We've now eliminated the entries below the pivot and can move on to step 5. We need to find our next pivot, and we'll start by moving down and over 1. Does our new pivot and all entries below it contain 0? Nope. Does the pivot contain 0? Nope. Does the pivot contain 1? No. So we need to divide row 3 by negative 9.6, which gives us 0, 0, 1, 0 0.2. And our pivot now contains 1. So we're done with step 5. We've now got, got 1's in all of our pivots and 0's below them all, so it's time to work our way back up. Step 6 is to find our final pivot, which we've already done. Step 7 is to then eliminate the non-zero entries above this pivot by subtracting off multiples of this row. So we subtract 2.45 times row 3 from row 2, and we'll subtract 1 times row 3 from row 1. This gives us 0, 1, 0, 
uh, 0 0.8 for row 2 and 1, 1, 0, 0 0.8 for uh, sorry, it gives us 0, 1, 0, 0 0.7 for row 2 and 1, 1, 0, 0 0.8 for row 1. We've thus eliminated the non-zero entries above the pivot and it's time to move on to step 8, which is to move to the next pivot. We then have to again eliminate the entries above the pivot. This time we'll do it by subtracting row 2 from row 1, which gives us 1, 0, and 0 0.1 for the top row. And we're done. Our augmented matrix now looks nice, and we can see that x1 equals 0 0.1, x2 equals 0 0.7, and x3 equals 0 0.3. So we know that 10% of the main stem water is coming from tributary 1, 70% is coming from tributary 2, and 30% is coming from tributary 3. Let's check this really quickly against our initial equations. Here are the equations, and if we plug it in, does 0 0.1 plus 0 0.7 plus 0 0.3 equal 1? Yep. Does 5 times 0 0.1 plus 3 times 0 0.7 plus 0 0.1 times 0 0.2 equal 2.62? Yep. So our solution, uh, uh, sorry, and does 2 times 0 0.1 plus 10 times 0 0.7 plus 12 times 0 0.2 equals 9.6? Yep. So our solution works. We now know that 70% of the water is coming from tributary 2. So if our goal is to clean up the estuary, we really want to focus on cleaning up the area around, around tributary 2. That's it for today's lecture. Don't forget to take the online quiz.